This is The Lonely Office, your playbook for navigating the messy line between work and life. You know, Matt, I remember years ago, it's weird mm -hmm. to say at the beginning of the century. <laughs> in the is. beginning of the century. In the beginning of the 2000s. <laughs> I was told I was an idiot for right. being a theater major. And you're never mm. going to have a career. Your job prospects are going to be a disaster. And frankly, it was a hard first decade. But I got to be honest with you, Matt. I know we're going to dive into this a bit. Maybe the creatives, maybe the philosophers, maybe the storytellers and the art history majors, maybe the thespians the are thespians. going to have the last laugh. We oh, might have man. the last laugh. It's be... 2024. It's looking different. That'd be hell of a karma, honestly, if that's where things end up going. I mean, uh, yeah, whatever you believe about AI, the short-term job trends in the economy and like the technology and information sector, particularly amongst engineers, isn't great news. There was a post here recently, right, yeah. Aaron, that we came across that kind of riffed on this theme. Yeah, yeah. so this was, a, this was a LinkedIn post from a guy named Chris Bach. It goes, if you studied software development, it's time to give up the dream and go back to school to get a real degree in something useful like right. art history, marketing, ceramics, or philosophy. I'm telling you, I'm not the only one thinking this. <laughs> there was a couple of great comments here too, Matt. One goes, never bought into this, quote, every kid must learn to code movement. It's short-sighted. Right. Coding is a means to an end. Kids are better off learning what matters to other human beings and the world at large, which is design, evolutionary psychology, behavioral science, communication, storytelling. There's my guy. And then someone else goes, I love philosophy and it drives my life in the backdrop of decision making. But right. how do you foresee it being used as a direct source of income? So cause yeah. a lot of stir and a lot of conversation here. Well, it, it caused a lot of stir because in the backdrop of this post, this has been recent job economic data that's been coming out. We covered on the show, the drastic corrections, the government, the BLS has been putting out on job additions in the economy for the period March, 2023 to March, 2024, overestimating the number of jobs in the economy, almost 900,000 jobs. And we talked about how the overestimation came from the tech sector, the information sector, a lot of these engineering jobs, right? That's professional right. services too, but definitely a lot of the engineering jobs. And when you also look at the most recent job report that just dropped in August, you see that very modest gains for most sectors. So that's not good news. You want to see like healthy addition, job additions in each sector. But again, in the information sector, the IT sector, negative, right? And this really squares with what you're hearing in the rumor mill amongst employees at tech firms and smaller IT firms, is that there's just not as many jobs out there. The job search is longer than they're used to it being. Things are different. And so it's funny because with that backdrop, you read this post and it's like, maybe he has something there. The, the, the question really is, Aaron, what's driving this? Are these just short-term trends because like of the over-hiring that happened in 2020 and 2021? Mm -hmm. Or is AI really at play here? Like, are there real efficiencies? And I don't think any of us know, but the fact that you're seeing real conversation online about the value of a computer science degree, is just, it's pretty shocking. There's no way this conversation would have happened in the early part of the century, the 2000s, where the mantra was software is eating the world, right? Mark Andreessen coming out. Mm -hmm. Where's that standing now? Is it AI is eating engineers' jobs? Let me ask you real quick, because there's a post I want to get to, and, and I want to get your thoughts on it, but do you think... What it might be doing is just revealing how important the humanities really are when it comes to the long-term sustainability of one's skills. I think that's why there's a lot of creatives like me who are kind of smiling at this post. The theater majors out there and the art history majors that people laughed at, they're <laughs> smiling right now, dude. Because all all it's ten important. of our listeners are I, theater majors. <laughs> hey, <laughs> let me tell you guys theater majors. I guarantee you, though, there's some secret art history <laughs> majors out there and some philosophy yes, majors are. that are listening, and you should reach out to us because they might have pivoted early on in the early off right. years, right? To one of these jobs that are now kind of ooh, hard to get and taking six to eight months to apply for. But guess what? Maybe they're looking back going, my instincts were right to begin with. Possibly. If we're on this theme of the here and now, let's mm -hmm. hit on that theme a bit. Perfect. I know you were going to talk about this post that references the experience of a 20-year-old or 26-year-old 10, 15 years ago versus today. The job market is, objectively speaking, for 20 to 24 year olds, 
more difficult mm. than the prime age working population. That's objectively speaking. New York Times dropped an article recently about the labor market suffering for that demo. But then even if you look at the economic data again, you see really clearly the unemployment rate for that demographic, 20 to 24, is 7.8%. Of course, for the entire population, it's sitting around 4.2, 4.3%. Now, this demo is always higher because you know they struggle a bit more kind of landing a job out of college or the first few years, but it is more difficult, like higher unemployment and more difficult for them to land a job. Look, I recall when I was in college, I hate the word coddled, but like there was a career center. They kind of took us through the ropes. They're like, look, we're going to have a, a career fair where you have a hundred resumes printed out. You have a little cute folder. You're walking into the career <laughs> fair and you, you know, you have like these two to three minute conversations with three-year or four-year veterans at the company. So they're young enough to kind of understand where you're coming from, but they're old enough right. to answer your questions. You connect, you hand the resume, and then you just wait. And they come to you. They come to you. They, they send you an email. Sometimes oh, yeah. they got phone calls like, hey, Matt, like we really enjoyed talking with you. We're going to invite you to an interview. That was the recollection I have of getting a job out of college. And I know you have a post that speaks to this. That was definitely my recollection. So this is a story that's echoed by a lot of folks. Maybe we can take the time machine or the DeLorean back 10 years ago to 2014. Uh, right. This poster echoes a very similar experience. 10 years ago, 2014, I graduated college. My only job seeking was going into my school career fair. There it is. And handing a copy of my resume to every company <laughs> there. I can imagine this guy just walking around. He's got the blazer. He's, yes. you know, maybe, maybe is he going tie? Are you going one button off? You know, who knows, right? Oh, You're just trying to make an impression. Those were the difficult decisions, actually. It wasn't, you yeah. know, it wasn't prepping. I was like, you know, how, how, how am I looking? <laughs> Exactly. You know, can I figure I don't out this not? I don't know if it was in vogue. You go cologne, a little bit of cool water. Maybe oh, that's cologne. late 90s. That's, Who yeah, knows? Yeah. Okay. Anyways, anyways, <laughs> he, goes, uh, he goes on. In the next week, I was called back for an in-person interview from essentially every big name company you've ever heard of with mm. no phone screens. He ends this post by saying, here's the thing. It was like a life of luxury. I went into these interviews with zero prep. And immediately under this post, someone goes, <laughs> hey, you guys were lucky. Count your stars. I am currently 26 years old and thinking of beginning a side hustle, tired of being unemployed. I know we're just coming off an episode where we talked about the nature of online digital job application processes versus the old school referral. Well, here's another old school process that our generation were accustomed to and we benefited from definitely is that career center, that college career center, the entire process was telegraphed for us. Right. And I, honestly, I'm incredibly grateful for that because I landed my first job because of that process. My understanding is now amongst college students that there, there's still elements of this there, but particularly after COVID, a lot of it has just been scratched. It's not really there. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, the thread that we're picking up here speaks to that, speaks to the fact that scratch as well. So yeah, hell of a disadvantage. And so add to that, we hit on this AI theme a lot on this show. How much of these jobs now also can be done by their two-year, three-year superiors with AI? You don't need to hire the, the college student anymore because the tool can do a lot of those simple first drafts, right? We've talked about this. It's a very uncertain job market for that demographic. For so sure. you talk about the career fair as a bit of a relic, regardless yeah. if it's that. Or an artifact, maybe. An artifact. Yeah, yeah maybe. Maybe. Now it's been replaced with the online job seeking process, the job boards, all this kind of digitization of that experience. Yeah. Okay. Then you talk about COVID. That's a real thing, right? That hit everybody. Speaking of theater professionals, I just was listening about how theaters are still trying to recover from COVID. I mean, they're bringing in stars to Broadway this season like they've never had before. So that was a very real thing. Okay. So all those right. things being true, let's go back to 2014. Let's go back to your job fair. Do you think the one missing piece, regardless of all of these environmental factors that we're facing now, is the right. human interaction? One thing that you talked about was, who did you go to see? You saw someone who is actually working at the company. So you weren't just right. handing over the resume. You got about four, five, 10, 15 minutes with a face-to-face. -face. It was like a mini interview. Do you think I'm just being nostalgic there or is that a very real component? Yeah, no, I think it's real. Cause you can stand I mean, out there, right? Because like right. you can actually stand out in that moment before they even look at your resume. You have an opportunity to be more than a piece of paper, 
I mean, it's mm. really that simple. And to add fuel to the fire here, yeah, the, let's the, add it. The, the, the volume of pieces of paper via the digital PDFs that are coming in have 10 x right? I mean, like, that's the phenomena of digital job application processes is that the wheel has been greased so much and it's so easy to apply that the recipient, the recruiter or the job hiring manager is inundated with resumes and it's a lot more difficult for them to make a decision based upon some qualitative data that they might get. And then arguably even the objective data that they're seeing on the resume isn't that objective. Like how much of these digital resumes these days you're, I'm not going to use the word doctoring, but you're mm. optimizing for keywords and a right. whole host of tactics that these influencers <laughs> online are peddling their <laughs> tactics to, to sign up for their services, right? And, right. and and so, yeah, you're disadvantaged because of the volume and then you're disadvantaged because you don't have any arena to showcase some, some level of qualitative feedback that they can get by meeting with you. And I guess it's an artifact and it's, it's so, unfortunate. Okay. So as a founder, as someone who's been through not only the hiring process, but bringing on employees, those young folks that are coming out of right. school looking for jobs, you've been on that side where you're listening, you're yeah. reading resumes, you're doing all that stuff. Okay. If that's the case, and let's cut right to it. If we've talked about what it was 10 years ago, that was nice. Uh, but right. we also talked about what it is and the numbers that reflect that. What are the tactics like now for the person in 2024 trying to stand out? What are some tactics that you know that you've seen work and that you've used to still stand out regardless of the condition right now? So let me just say this in the background. We know the job search is taking longer. It's taking longer right now for everyone. The percentage of unemployed people hired within three months has decreased by almost 15 percentage points. So it's gone from three months to a five-month process. If you find yourself amongst that cohort of people where you're past the three-month process now, you need to change tactics, right? Like something's not working. And one way or one thing you can try is look at the type of companies that you historically may not have applied to, for example, that, hey, I might work for a smaller company or even a startup that's raised some money and is in a similar sector, but you don't even know existed because you've never done research, right? That's right. I would say probably 40, 50% of job applicants are just applying to the S&P 500 same or the old, mature companies, old, the same old companies. Yeah, like off the beaten path, I would argue here, there's a whole host of startups that have just capitalized. There's public data sources you can use like Crunchbase and other online sites where you can see who are the startups that have just raised money. They've just gotten their coffers filled. They got to hire because their investors are expecting them to hire. And you're almost guaranteed, I would argue, at least a year to two year job security if they've just raised. The usual kind of runway of a company after financing is anywhere from 12 to 24 months. And they could be in the same sector as you are. If you're a nurse or a physician assistant, there's a lot of healthcare startups hiring right now for those sectors. If you're an architect, there's a lot of startups in the architectural services sector too that are kind of launching right now. And first and foremost, the volume is different. These startups are not seeing the same volume. So maybe you will get that read that you didn't get. Maybe you will get the opportunity to get on a Zoom call. I don't want to drop names here, but there are a lot of actual job platforms that are specifically catered towards those type of startups you can find and apply to those jobs. So we can bring it to an end here. What I'm hearing in my brain is go to the space that's less crowded or go to a place where there's need, but less noise. The salary too. I, so, we're going to be bringing on a expert on kind of startups and the salaries they offer, the odds of them being successful. So we'll, we'll have him on a that's show a great in, tease the, for a in the future. Episode. Yeah. yeah. And what he found initially, some of his research is there's many solid jobs these startups are offering where the discrepancy in pay with a mature company is not all that great, actually. Again, if you're in the market for three months or five months or six months and you can't land a job, you got to change tactics. And if you can land a job with a startup, even if you get docked in pay, again, there's upside in the stock options of that startup. That could be a nice thing on your resume. It's a, a different type of experience that you can use to sell for your next, maybe more stable traditional company job. I'll end it with this. Take yourself back to 2014. You're at a job fair. Just picture it right there. You're at a job fair and you're surrounded by tables and future potential employers. And you see the big names. You got the Fortune 500. They're really slick. They're packaged really well. <laughs> they got the glossy print, everything yes. on the table. Now around yes. the corner though, Matt, right. there's a smaller table. It's a little scraggly. And maybe yeah. the 
gentleman or a lady there, they're a little bit disheveled because they've been working so hard. Don't just pass up that table and assume that there's not an opportunity there. Why don't you venture over, give them a few minutes and see what they're all about because there may be a place where you can stand out. Yeah. Small businesses are the engine of the economy in this country. We all know that. It's almost cliche to say that. And so particularly now we're in a downward rate cycle. We're about to get the first interest rate cut next week. Could be good times looking forward with small businesses who capitalize off the cheaper small business loans and start hiring again. So yeah, I think for sure that's an opportunity. Hey, you made it. Thanks for tuning into The Lonely Office. If you like what you heard, follow us on all major podcast platforms so you don't miss an episode and make sure and tap five stars and leave a review. I know everyone says it, but it actually helps others like you discover the show. Remember, the topics you hear us talk about on the show are sourced from Glassdoor communities where professionals are having candid conversations about their careers anonymously with others in their industry. To be part of that conversation, download the Glassdoor app. And when you're in the app, make sure and join the Lonely Office Bowl. That's where we are. When you're there, you can suggest a topic idea or an episode idea, or you can make it more formal and email us at thelonelyoffice at glassdoor.com. We'll catch you next time.